there's hope for tomorrow, we must first embark on the darkest hour. Welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. We've all had those moments in life that we won't forget. Maybe it was the time you met your first best friend, or that really awesome family vacation. The perfect sound of nothing, just your breath and nature. But those are all pretty nice things to recall. Rather happy memories. And we all know that there are things that stick with you for different reasons. They aren't just filed away with all the other memories. Instead, they haunt you. And well, if you don't have any of those yet, I think you just might after tonight's show. So, let's get started, shall we? I'm a retired wildland firefighter with the National Forest Services, and this is one of my craziest or creepiest things I experienced before I retired. The year is 2004, Hell's Canyon area in the middle of Idaho. My crew and I had been working all day on an emerging incident, and we were going to be working through the night. I was second in charge at the time, so I was ahead of everybody, scouting the area for any problems on an ATV. I had made my way towards a logging road. It was a road that clearly hadn't been used in a long time. As I cruised down the empty road, I could see ahead what looked like a bobcat, or lynx, just sitting in the middle of the road. Normally, these things are pretty skittish, so I wasn't sure why it wasn't moving or running away once it could hear me. This thing just stands there for a good ten seconds, but then it screams at me, and it scampers up into a tree not five feet off the road. I thought this was strange, but not exactly unnerving. About a half mile down the road, I find a small cabin, Now, I thought this was extra strange. It was federal land, and no private structures should be there. I got off the ATV just to look around, and as I walked the perimeter, I could see that all of the windows and doors had been boarded shut and tight. Yeah, someone had done a good job of securing this place. The door had been replaced by something metal, thick metal, and a giant chain and lock that secured the metal door to the log cabin frame. Someone did not want anything getting in or out of this place. I peered through the remaining space between the hole in the door and the chain that was coming from it. The house was furnished. Furniture in the house, but it had been tossed around. It looked like garbage, papers, practically no light getting through, but enough to see that there were chairs and a table turned over. Something that looked like it could be a couch, but it was too dark. You could see broken glass or a broken mirror on the floor. Something shiny littered the whole ground. I stood there a minute and honestly couldn't make up my mind about this place. I did feel unsettled. 
So I hopped on the ATV and headed back up the road. And things got a little bit more unsettling. Right where the bobcat had been, there stood an old woman. She was incredibly tan, like she'd been in the sun for years. And she wore a badly tattered nightgown with bare feet. And she was just standing there. I yelled out to her, asking if she needed some help. She didn't say anything, so I almost asked again. But before I could, she screamed at me. I actually felt my knees get weak, grateful that I'd been sitting down at the time of the scream. It was the exact same scream as the cat from before. Then... She climbs right up the same tree, and so much faster than any human has the right to be climbing. I didn't stick around. I just headed out fast. I don't even think I had my eyes open as I made my way back down that road. I wasn't sure what had just happened, but I tried to unpack it on the way back. By the next morning, after working through the night... I was still unsure of who or what I had seen. So I asked a local guy at the breakfast bar about the cabin, the one off the old logging road. He said he'd never heard of anything like that, that most folks don't hang out in that area. He then started to ask other patrons at the bar. And sure enough, after asking around a little, a local man hears us talking, and he informs us, that I'd seen a skinwalker. He was a tall, very serious Native American man, so originally he actually used a different word, one that escaped my brain, but something I couldn't pronounce anyways. And he translated it to skinwalker, thinking that would be a familiar term for me. But at the time, I didn't really know what that was either. Honestly, to this day, I haven't done a lot of research on it because of what the man said to me. He told me very seriously that I wasn't the first to see the skinwalker and that I wouldn't be the last. He said I was lucky that I was able to leave unscathed and that I should never approach or engage with a skinwalker. It's best to not think about it again. I held on to that advice for several years only ever talking about it with my original crew that weekend. Eventually, I told my wife, but that was three years after it had happened. She asked what took me so long to tell her, and I don't know. I guess for a while there, I genuinely feared for our safety, and I thought if she didn't know about it, nothing could affect her. So, I don't really know what I saw, but... I know that I saw something that I've never seen since and that I hope to never see again. So one time, me and two of my friends were chilling in my living room. My two friends were both sitting on my couch about six or seven feet away from me, who was laying on my lazy boy. I was getting drowsy and thought I might take a little bit of a nap. And I started getting a little bit cold. I need to mention here that I'd been unconsciously holding on to a cigarette lighter in one hand that had a metal lighter case on it. Anyways, since I was beginning to get chilly, I went to put my arms underneath me to warm them up. And the second I did that, I started being electrocuted. And I don't mean shocked like static electricity or something. I mean my entire body started convulsing uncontrollably. I remember in that instant 
putting every ounce of my focus and energy into attempting to stand up. And after a few short seconds, I was able to. The moment I was able to, the electricity stopped shocking me, and I stood there, flabbergasted, not sure what the hell just happened. And what's even weirder, neither of my friends had even noticed what had just happened. When I told them, they didn't believe me. And it didn't really make a lick of sense to any of us since I hadn't been touching, or even near touching, anything electrical. My one friend turned the chair I'd been sitting on over and helped me look everywhere around for some kind of explanation. We found nothing. But a few minutes later, as I sat trying to convince them both that it had really happened, I opened my hand up and set the lighter down. And on my hand sat a little square burn, the same shape as the metal lighter that I'd been holding in my hand when it happened. I was shocked, but also relieved because the burn was proof that it had really happened. I have no clue how I was able to get my body to stand up, or how I knew that's what would make it stop. But it did. And I still have no idea how I got shocked so dramatically from sitting in a cushioned chair. But it happened. So what do you think it was? My husband and I bought a house in California. It was newly renovated and small, perfect for our small family of four. Before it was renovated, drug addicts had squatted in the house for months, and so even though the history wasn't good, I never felt any dark energy in the house. Skip forward eight years later. A family member was temporarily living with us, and without our knowledge, was using heavy drugs. Of course, once we discovered that, we immediately had them leave and get help. We found out that they'd been using drugs in our garage, where our washing machine and dryer are located. After they moved out, I began to feel dark energy in the darkness near our garage door. Whenever I went to do laundry... I felt this menacing male spirit glaring at me from the darkness. Being terrified in the garage, I would rush through the laundry and run inside. That was my routine. This happened for three years. Eventually, my husband would burn sage and walk through the house, especially the garage. It seemed to help. Months later... I was doing the laundry at night. While I was distracted by my thoughts, I heard a voice that sounded like a male. It was breathing heavily behind my ear. I immediately ran out of the garage. This happened one other time. The paranormal weirdness has gone away, but I still feel slightly afraid while in the garage. But this fear feels different. I think that it is due to memories of the bad energy. And maybe not so much bad energy itself.
Malakoff Diggins State Park. It's one of those places that you see signs for when you're driving down Highway 20, or the Yuba Donner Scenic Byway in Nevada City, Gold Rush Town. In 2013, myself and a few friends decided to visit Malakoff for a hike on the way back from Reno. No big deal. We hike a lot, and we're used to hot weather, strange terrain, etc. Well, we weren't used to what we experienced while we were in this particular park, and it made for a rather short hike. The park itself was pretty beautiful, and we could see from a map that there was a pond, Diggins Pond. It sat essentially at the center of all the various trail ends. We'd learned that Malakoff was actually part of an abandoned town, a small town that was filled with people that were chasing the gold rush. They'd even settled and had a schoolhouse built. It wasn't much of a town anymore aside from that schoolhouse, but we weren't really there to stay. We just wanted to chase daylight, not in the car, find us a body of water, and then hit the road. My friend, we'll call her Carrie. Carrie and I were a bit ahead of everybody else, and we thought it would be funny to hide behind one of the various large rocks or trees that surrounded the trail. We wanted to scare the others. One of our friends was especially freaked out by the little abandoned town feel, so we knew that we'd get her good. We quieted our steps and found the perfect rock, boulder, and we just waited for our friends to pass. It's easy to realize how long you've been waiting for someone when you're in a crouched position. My thighs were starting to burn, and as Carrie and I looked at each other, it was clear that we were thinking the same thing. What's taking them so long? We slowly stood up and peeked out towards the trail. We couldn't see our friends. They probably got distracted by something shiny. We joked as we walked back in the direction of our friends. When our friends were in view again, we were greeted with a very serious, there you guys are, what the hell? And they went on about how that was so creepy and to not do that again. In this moment, Carrie and I were both sort of confused asking if they thought that we were lost or something, saying that the funny thing was we were originally hiding over there. We would pointed over the hill towards the rock, but you guys never showed up. Everyone was sort of quiet. And now, we all looked confused. The crying noises, you guys. The crying noises and the voices. Carrie and I looked at each other then back at everyone else. What voices? We asked this, almost in unison. Everyone gave us that look like, enough is enough, and it became clear that they weren't going to explain themselves. As we stood there in almost silence, I noticed that I had goosebumps. I looked around and everyone else did too, all along our arms and our legs. Maybe we're closer to the water than we thought. I started to say this when I was cut off. Shh. I was shushed by more than one of my friends. And at first, I was offended, but then I heard it. It sounded like crying. It sounded like children crying. We were all so focused and so silent that when something moved just behind us, we all jumped at the same time, trying not to make a sound, but unsuccessfully making a whole lot of it. Suddenly, it felt like something was near us, like watching us. We said to each other out loud that we should head out, but it felt like we couldn't move, like... We couldn't leave the way that we'd came in. Like something was blocking us from doing that, or maybe it was our instincts telling us that something was over there. Something that we didn't want to be a part of. We all sort of 
made a circle with our bodies, all of our backs facing one another, getting a full view of our surroundings. We could hear the sound of something heavy walking on the trail, but none of us could see anyone walking. We asked each other over and over, looking from trail end to trail end, but there was no one there, no one but us. I squeezed my friend's hands and I told them quietly that I thought something was getting closer. My friends nodded. No one else said anything for a while. It was clear now that the sound was much closer, practically in our bubble. But there's no one here or there, so what? It was Carrie that led the charge, declaring... Whatever, let's go. This shit is too weird. And she took off running. So we followed suit. We hadn't gotten far when suddenly my friend yelled out, like she'd gotten hurt. So we all halted and turned back. She was on the ground. Holy shit, you're bleeding. I know it's not exactly the best thing to say to someone who's injured, but... I was yelling this as I reached for a towel and my first aid kit. But my friend said she was fine. She told me not to bother with the kit, that we just needed to get back to the car. I wasn't feeling right about just leaving her bleeding, but she was already up and going. So, again, I followed. Almost as soon as the car doors closed, my friend, the one that was hurt, started crying. But it was like, as soon as we went to comfort her, she snapped out of it and told us to start driving. So Carrie started to drive, and we sat in silence for a minute, pretty sure we were just decompressing. Something grabbed me. Something grabbed me and pulled me backwards. That's why I'm bleeding. Like, I didn't trip, you guys. I hate that place. At first, I didn't know what to think, but then it was like, oh yeah, we experienced something super weird before that happened. We were running because we knew something bad was there. You guys believe me, right? Like, what was that? My friend finally asked. Of course we believe you. I mean, I heard the crying, and that definitely wasn't me or Carrie. If that's the same crying that you guys heard, it wasn't us. The conversation after I said that just sort of spiraled, and we all recapped the nonsense we just experienced. Eventually, we'd been driving and talking about the weirdness so long that we didn't even notice that one of our friends hadn't said anything for quite some time. That's when we all learned together that Malakoff Diggins State Park has a bit of a dark past. We found several stories on the place, different variations of what really broke the town, but one story that continued to pop up. It was a dark one. The story of a schoolteacher who had murdered one of his students. But he hadn't just murdered a student. He'd murdered the child by hanging him from the rafters of the schoolhouse in front of the rest of the children. Yeah, it was one of the darker things I'd heard in a while. I mean, just know this. We aren't adrenaline junkies. We don't go to places with the intention of getting scared or anything like that. Had we known the dark history, we likely would have picked a different hike. It just sort of shook all of us, especially my friend who was grabbed. But it's been hard for all of us to grasp or conceptualize the idea that spirits or some unknown energy can actually hurt you. I mean, that just doesn't seem like it should be something that is possible Yet here we are, talking about that time that it happened. 
Well, that's the only creepy experience I've ever had, but it's enough for me. I, or we, definitely always at least research the trails and parks that we go to now. We don't need a repeat of that one summer, we always say. We'll do anything to never have to hear the sound of children crying in the woods again. Well, friends, this brings us to the end of tonight's show. But be sure to subscribe and join me every Friday night for a new episode of The Darkest Hour. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, Darkest Hour, at gmail.com. Or check out our subreddit, The Darkest Hour YT. Stay spooky. <laughs>